eating on America right now, I just want to say this. America per se isn't the problem. It's a sin problem. It's a sin problem. It's a sin problem. And uh, that's exactly where we're going today uh, in here in today's message. But turn with me, if you would, please, to the book of Psalms. We actually have two opening texts this morning. And uh, by the way, we want to acknowledge our newlyweds here this morning, Jerry and Debbie. Dan Becker, congratulations to you. Give us a big wave back there so everybody, all right, Lord bless them. Good to have you here this morning. Um, and by the way, we're praying for the, all the churches in California. How many's heard the ruling from the governor out there? No singing, no out loud singing. We're like, really? Really? And so uh, how many know uh, the time's going to come when we're going to be like the, the three Hebrew children? We're going to have to make up our mind. We're going to have to choose whether we're going to bow or we're going to stand up for what is right. Amen. And so let's be praying for our churches in California. How many would just love to see revival break out in California? Ooh, Jesus. Amen. Uh, Psalms chapter 33, verse number 12. Very familiar passages of scripture here today. I'm not going to probably give you any new divine revelation, but some things that just need to be said. It says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. How many believe that God has raised up the United States of America, even with all of her faults? Listen here, I promise you he has. No other nation under the heavens has gotten out the gospel like the United States of America has. We have sent more missionaries to the world than any other country ever has. We have stood beside the nation of Israel, and God has raised us up for, for those two reasons. If no other reasons, how many would say amen? And then over to Proverbs chapter 14, verse number 34. It says righteousness. Everybody say righteousness. Which the, the definition of righteousness is just simply being in a right standing with God. You've got everything right with God. Righteousness, what does it do? It exalts a nation, but sin, there it is. But sin is a reproach to any people. Notice that how it doesn't matter who we are, but sin will always defile us. Sin is a reproach to any people. Brother Randy, I'm going to ask that you stand and ask the Lord's blessing over the reading of his word and the ministry here today, and let's pray along with him, church. Brother. Father, we thank you today for our nation, for our nation that we stand in for independence, and we acknowledge our dependency on you. Yes, Lord. Father, when we turn from that dependency, cause our eyes to come back on you. Yes. And everybody said, amen. amen and amen. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. For righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. The title of our message today comes to us in the form of a question. And that question simply being this. What makes a nation great? What makes a nation great? Is it its people? Its leaders? Its economic status? Its places of learning? Higher education? Universities? Social status? 
What makes a nation great? Well, we've already answered this question here in our opening texts. And the simple answer to what makes a nation great is simply this. Where we stand with Almighty God. Where we stand with Almighty God. It's not a question as if, is God on our side? But the question is, are we on God's side? Hello? <laughs> Righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. Can I say to us today that it doesn't matter how great economy a nation might have. It doesn't matter if a nation has strong leadership or weak leadership. It doesn't matter if a nation is full of knowledge, education, and universities. It doesn't really matter how big or how small that nation might be. How many know the nation of Israel is a very small country? <laughs> it doesn't matter if a nation has great athletes, how many athletes we send to the Olympics. It doesn't matter if a nation is full of rock stars, movie stars, and famous people. It doesn't matter if a nation has a lot of fun things to do and places to go on vacation. We're talking about what makes a nation great. It doesn't matter if a nation has some of the greatest entertainment in the world like Las Vegas or Disney World, Disneyland. In fact, it doesn't matter if a nation is one of the most technically advanced countries in the world. And by the way, has anyone figured out what nation we're referring to here today? Our nation. Now, one of the greatest mission fields of the world, the United States of America. But all the things we have just listed might help to describe or define a nation as they do ours. But at best... They can only offer opportunities and resources to their people. With all of our might, power, and strength, all of our money, all of our military might, there's only so much that we can do as human beings. If you know your Bible today, you will know that there is only one person who can truly build anything. Anything that will last. And we find that today in Psalms chapter 127, verse number 1. It simply says this, Unless the Lord builds the house. Today we, we could say, Unless the Lord builds the nation, they labor in vain, who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. I want you to think about the 244 years of the history of our nation, all the things that have transpired down through the years, the good, the bad, and the ugly. All the money we have went through as a nation, now we're in what, trillions dollars of debts that and we look back at the history of our nation and we see everything that has happened and 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 like I said a lot of good a lot of not so good but we know as humans we are limited in what we can do God will allow us to do some things in our own strength but can I remind us here this morning that there are some things that we cannot do without God's help. 
cannot do without God's help. How many understand today that all the kingdoms of this world will eventually fail and fall? They will fail and they will fall. There's only one kingdom that will last forever, and that's found here in Luke chapter 1, verse number 31. When Gabriel was telling Mary about the child she was going to bear, he described it in this fashion, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great. How many know as Americans we're aspiring to be great? Be great at everything we do. But how many know there's only one great one? He will be great and he will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob. How long? Forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. No end. No end. end. As we look back and we look in history and we look in the Bible throughout the Word of God, we see great kingdoms. We see the Babylonian kingdom. We see Egypt. And we see all these great kings and kingdoms throughout history who have been raised up, but they have fallen. After much thought and much prayer here this week on what we should speak about here today. I believe the Lord has given us the reason why we are in the state we're in here today. And it simply comes down to this statement right here. America ceased being great when her people ceased being good. America ceased to be great. And I don't know if we were ever great. Maybe we were just great in our own prideful eyes. I don't know. I know there was a day and age when we feared God more than we fear Him now. We're going to talk about that here in a minute. But I believe America ceased being great when her people ceased to be good. How many understand we cannot be great without being good? We can't be blessed without being righteous. We can't have peace in our streets. We can't have peace in our homes. We can't have peace in our places of work when we refuse to serve the Prince of Peace. We cannot expect a righteous offspring when all we plant are evil seeds. We can't expect to be a great nation when our people refuse to be good. Let's just go back here in time, recent time, not not hundreds of years. But let's just go back here a few years ago and and let's see when we stopped being good. On June 25th, 1962, the U.S. Supreme Court declared school-sponsored prayers were unconstitutional. Unconstitutional. We know how rock and roll music, as well as other forms of music, were introduced to our society in the 1950s and 60s. And now how the pop culture of today and the music industry of today dominates our world, sets the course for our young people. Instead of heroes being in the church, our young people grow up wanting to be like Madonna. Yeah. Madonna. Say the 
Miley Cyrus. And we wonder why. We wonder why we have a generation of youth now out in the streets raising hell. Come on, somebody. Many of us remember the sexual revolution of the 1960s, which was no more than hippies having all the free sex, drugs, and alcohol they could have. And I'm sorry if you were a hippie from the 60s, I'm just saying. How many are thankful for the Jesus people that got saved out of that? And then we went into the women's rights movement. It's my body. I can do with it what I want. And no, ladies, please, I'm not a male chauvinist. But I'm talking about an extreme agenda of a liberal woman's movement. We wonder why. And then let's not forget that in 1973, a U.S. Supreme Court case called Roe v. Wade affirmed that access to safe and legal abortion is now a constitutional right. Can I say this? It took a while, but now we're reaping what we sowed. It took a while. It took a while. And then finally on June 26, 2015, just a few short years ago, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down the all-state ban on same-sex marriage, giving homosexuals the right to marry in all 50 states. And then we wonder why. We wonder why. Not to mention the social and racial injustices, racial profiling, police brutality, corruption in our government, violence in our streets, mass shootings in our schools. Watch and see just how many shootings and murders take place this weekend in Chicago, Illinois alone. (laughs) I want to show you this little short video, and when I seen this, I was just flabbergasted. I thought I had seen it all, heard it all, but I I, I want us to watch this little video clip from a city council meeting in what we would call a conservative state of Florida. Let's watch this. Can't get the volume to it? A city council meeting in Florida, they open up their meeting with prayers, not to the God of the Bible, but to Baal, the humanist, and to Satan himself. If you guys get that sound back up at any time, just, just let me know. But we'll we'll share it on our Facebook page today. It just, I watched it, and I watched it again. 
And I had to watch it again. I'm like, this is like made up, right? I mean, this is. And then we wonder why. But our opening text said, righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. I think sometimes we forget how sinful we have become. That's right, brother. We discussed it today. You've heard the little saying, you can uh, take the frog. If you take a pot of boiling water, you throw the frog in the pot, he's going to jump out. But if you put that same frog in pot of water and slowly, gradually turn up the heat, you will eventually cook that frog. Why? Because it, it doesn't happen overnight. How many understand the condition of our world hasn't transpired overnight? I'm not that old. I'm 51 years old, but I, I can tell you this is not the same country I was born in. Oh, yeah, and let's not forget the cesspool of pornograph pornography in our country. I tried to look up some statistics, but thankfully my phone had a guard on it, so I couldn't look up anything to do with that. Somebody say, praise the Lord. But the only thing I could find was way back from the year 2013. And in 2013, does anybody want to guess who the global leader in porn was? You guess it, the United States of America. Back then, the U.S. was producing 60% of global internet pornography. With two-thirds of that coming out of one state. You want to guess which state? They just banned worship. They just banned singing California. <laughs> Those numbers were for, from 2013. I'm sure it's a lot worse today. But it's not the same, it's not the same country I was born in. In the 1960s, there was an American sitcom called The Dick Van Dyke Show. Anybody remember The Dick Van Dyke Show? I used to love to watch that as a kid. But in that sitcom, the married couple who were Rob and Laura Petri, anybody remember that? Rob and Laura. Did you realize that they couldn't even be seen together, even though they were married, they couldn't even be seen together in the same bed? They had two separate twin beds on the set. <laughs> How many know we've come a long ways, baby? My Lord. And so with all of this in mind, taking into account the millions and millions of babies that we have aborted. Think about that. As well as the sex trade. The sex trade industry that is very much alive and well here in America. And then what many are doing in Hollywood that most Americans don't even know anything about. How they are sacrificing the children and drinking the blood of our children. I hate to say it, but as American Christians, we, become, we have become desensitized. There was a time when we used to blush. We would get embarrassed over sin and 
If years ago, even if I called out things like this from the pulpit, I'd probably be ran off. Now, with all of these things, and there's so much more that we could talk about, but I, I hate to take any more time to exalt the negative. I want to say, I want to ask this, how many believe in something called cause and effect? Cause and effect. The Bible calls it this. In fact, it's a law from the Word of God. It's called sowing and reaping. Seed time and harvest. Not going to cease, is it? Galatians chapter 6, verse number 7, it says this. Do not be deceived, for God is not mocked. How many believe here in America we are mocking God? Boy, I wish we could have seen this video of this city council. I mean, it was just mocking God. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. Now, I, I realize that we don't live under the law anymore, and how many are thankful for grace? Right. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Thank God for the cross. Thank God for grace. But yet, with that being said, how many understand here this morning that God, God never did change His mind about some things? In fact, there's not too many things that you can find that God changed His mind about anything. God never did change his mind about what was right and what was wrong. Even though grace was an amazing thing, even though Jesus came and changed everything, a better covenant, we talked about this Wednesday night. He liberated us, liberated us from the curse of the law. But with that being said, God never did change his mind on what was right and wrong. He never did change his mind about how good or how evil behavior will be rewarded. So, if you will bear with me, we will go to the Old Testament. Leviticus, and I understand this wouldn't even be tolerated in some of our churches in America today. To read out of the Old Covenant. But I don't see where God ever changed his mind about this stuff. Leviticus chapter 26, verse number 1, he says, You shall not make idols for yourself. How many know God's been dealing with our idols here in America for the last four months? Come on, somebody. Neither a carved image nor a sacred pillar shall you rear up for yourselves, nor shall you set up an engraved stone in your land to bow down to it. For I am the Lord your God. And you shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary, for I am the Lord. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and perform them, then I will give you rain in its season. The land shall yield its produce and the true trees of the field shall yield their fruit. How many know we need rain in order for our crops to grow and to, to give a good yield? How many know if it don't start raining pretty soon, the farmers are going to get real concerned? I wonder if that's the next disaster that we're soon to face here in America. Your threshing shall last till the time of vintage, and the vintage shall last till the time of sowing. You shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land safely. I will give you peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none will make you afraid. Boy, how many know this sounds like a pretty good deal right here? If we obey. I will rid the land of evil beasts, and the sword will not go through your land, and you shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall by the sword before you. Five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight, and your enemies shall fall by the sword before you. For I will look on you favorably. How many, how many love the favor of God? And make you fruitful, multiply you, and confirm my covenant with you. And you shall eat the old harvest and clear out the old because of the new. And 
I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall abhor you, and I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. For I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and you should not be their slaves. I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you walk up right. And I don't even want to go to verse 14, but we must. But, everybody say but. But if you do not obey me and do not observe all these commandments, and if you despise my statutes or if your soul abhors my judgments, so that you do not perform all my commandments but break my covenant. I also will do this to you. I will even appoint terror over you, wasting disease and fever, which shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. How many know we have a virus among us today? And you shall sow your seed in vain, and your enemies shall eat it. I will set my face against you, and you shall be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you shall reign over you. Wow. Wow. How many know there's a group of people in America who hate the church? And I tell you what, we better make it to the voting booth this fall. That's all I'm going to say about that. We better make it to the voting booth this fall. Those who hate you shall reign over you, and you shall flee when no one pursues you. And after all this, if you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. I will break the pride of your power. Ooh. I will make your heavens like iron and your earth like bronze, and your strength shall be spent in vain. For your land shall not yield its produce nor shall the trees of the land yield their fruit. Then if you walk contrary to me and are not willing to obey me, I will bring on you seven times more plagues according to your sins. I will also send wild beasts among you which shall rob you of your children. Wow. Wow. How many know our children have literally been robbed from our churches? Hmm. Which shall rob you of your children, destroy your livestock, and make you few in number. And your highways shall be desolate. It's very simple. When we cease to be good, we cease to be great. We cannot, we cannot be great outside of God. I don't care how good of a person we are. I don't care how moral, good-hearted, whatever you want to say. When we take God out of the equation, how many know we've asked God to leave our schools? We've asked God to leave our courthouses. We we remove the Ten Commandments out of the courthouses because it, it offends people. Not taking into account that it offends God. Cause and effect. Sowing and reaping. Oh, we got away with it for a while. We did. We got away with it for a while. But how many know the chickens are coming home to roost? But with all that being said, I want to take it to the next level here today. Because it's not just the nation's problem. It's not just the nation's fault. But I believe there's a particular group of people who are to blame for this. And it's not the Republicans. Not even the Democrats.
but it's right here. The church. The pulpits of America. All the pulpits of America that have compromised and have chosen to go with the easy, greasy, grace, love of God message. The church. We've said it so many times here lately. As the church goes, so goes the nation. I believe the same, the very same opportunity that was afforded to the children of Israel of the Old Testament is afforded to the church of the New Testament. The church of the New Testament, which, which is us here today, the church of today, has the opportunity to not only be something special, but to do something special. Do you remember the message? Do you just want to see a miracle or do you want to be a miracle? How many know the day and age in which we live, the world in which we live, the world needs to see the church stand up and be a miracle? Be part of the solution? <laughs> let's go back again to the Old Testament and let's, let's see what was said of the children of Israel and see if we can correlate this to the church of the New Testament. Exodus chapter 19, verse number 1, it says, In the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt. Now what's <laughs> correlation number one? How many understand that God walked through his servant Moses God could walk the children of Israel out of Egypt, but yet he couldn't walk Egypt out of the children of Israel. Every time there was a hardship, every time there was a test or the trial, they would begin to whine and complain and say, Moses, we want to go back to Egypt. Really? You want to go back to slavery? You want to go back to bondage? You want to be back, go back to being whipped? Well, at least we had our watermelons. How many thankful you ain't got to get whipped for your watermelon? Come on, somebody. I'm just saying. God walked the children of Israel out of Egypt, but he couldn't walk Egypt out of the children of Israel. In the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. For they had departed from Rephidim and had come to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey, obey, <laughs> obey, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall say or which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Now how many understand why while Moses was on the top of the mountain getting the download from heaven getting all of this information that God wanted him to have yes. on that very same mountain in the valley, Aaron was taking all the gold and creating a golden image. Very same mountain. So it's not about the experience. It's not about whether God is real or not. How many know the God of the mountain is still God of the valley? Yeah. 
But this is Old Testament, and it's not relevant today, is it? I mean, we might as well just rip the Old Testament out. I mean, well, let's stay in the Old Testament, but we'll go to one of the Old Testament prophets, and that would be Isaiah who would speak to a generation yet to come. Isaiah chapter 60. The word of the Lord came came through the prophet Isaiah and said, Arise, shine. I guess he knew that we were probably going to be asleep and dark. I I don't know. Why did he say arise and shine? Obviously, we weren't in that position. Obviously, we weren't arisen. Obviously, we weren't shining. Arise, shine. shine. In other words, wake up and do what I've called you to do. (laughs) Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon Me, us, the church. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross or much darkness the people. Wow, that's got to be today. Got to be today. But the Lord. But the Lord. The Lord will arise over you. And his glory will be seen upon you. How many know we've been called to be a glory carrier to this world? Any glory carriers? How many know when Moses came down from the mountain, his face was like, shining because of the glory of God? How many know the world should, should be able to see Jesus all over us? His glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light. That's how I know it's talking about the church age. The Gentile age. The Gentiles shall come to your light. And kings to the brightness of your rising. My question is this. What will happen if the church doesn't rise and shine? If we think it's bad now, if the church starts to cower down, if we start to get scared and and retreat and start listening to governors like, what is it, Newsom out in California... If the church goes in hiding now, can I say that our nation doesn't have a prayer? (laughs) I want you to look at your neighbor today, and I want you to remind them, we are the hope of this nation. We're the hope of this nation. Not President Trump. Not the Republicans, not the Democrats, not our military might. Our only hope is Jesus. Oh, I know that sounds like a Christian cliche. I know it sounds like I'm, I'm speaking Christianese up here. But sometimes it's so simple that we miss it. Our only hope is Jesus. And let me say this, if God doesn't intervene soon, we're going to destroy ourselves. <laughs> Arise and shine, for thy light has come. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. 
How many understand the greater the darkness, the greater the opportunity? The church in America is faced with a great decision today. We're at a great crossroads. Strategic inflection point, whatever you want to say. But if we don't hurry up and make up our mind what we're going to do and who we are in Christ and stand up and take our authority and begin to pray and fast and intercede and repent and do what we need to do, stop looking to Washington for the answers. Stop expecting President Trump to fix all of this. You say, you don't like our president? Oh, no, I'm praying for him. My God, I believe he's been put in office for such a time as this. But we got to cover him in prayer because the enemy's out to get him. But let me say this in closing, and praise team, you can come. Truthfully, I don't expect much out of our nation. How many know sinners do what sinners do? What do sinners do? Sin. We can't expect the world to get this right. You know, we, we, we watch the news and we're appalled by everything that's happening, and we should be, we should be. But what do we expect sinners to do? Somebody who is selfish and prideful and consuming everything upon their own lust and in it for them and has no regard of human life or property. or We expect the world to get this right. Kind of like Pastor Josh's message last week. What did you expect to see? I don't know, maybe there was a time in America when sinners were just good people. I know there was a time in America when you could leave your doors unlocked. You could trust your neighbors. So I think things were different. I think things were different. In fact, I know they were. But we can't expect the nation to get this right. We can't expect the world to get this right. But how many understand here today we should expect a lot out of the church? The church. And if you're like me, you're, you're kind of, uh, you're a little bit confused right now. You're a little bit frustrated because you just feel like there's more we should be doing. How many really feel like there's just more we should be doing? And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do everything I know to do, trying to be a little more aggressive and sharing my faith and, you know, getting outside of my comfort zone and so on and so forth and doing things I wouldn't have normally done. But, you know, I, I just feel a little frustrated sometimes because I, I feel like the devil's got us cornered. And so we're living in a day and age when we, we, we just can't expect to do church as usual and expect to get results, I don't think. I, I, I think we need to come outside. We need to think outside of the box. Most definitely, we need to let God outside of the box we put Him in. We need to come out of the sanctity of our four walls, the safety of our four walls. Thank God the, the church at Lincoln is praying in the park. Can somebody say amen? Amen. And speaking of, Pastor Jared mentioned it, we're, uh, we're going to be going to the, uh, the assembly. Pastor Darren has, has, has raised a tent over there. And we're going to be preaching Sunday night, the August 2nd. Can somebody say amen? And so, yes, I believe the church is finally coming together. And that's, and that's something we have to do. That's something we have to do. But I think as this continues to 
unveil itself. <laughs> I, I want us to know that there's some things we're going to have to endure. And this is going to lead us to our next message next Sunday morning. There's some things that are going to happen. If the Lord tarries, there's some things that the church will face in America. And, and persecution is one of them. Persecution is one of them. But you've heard me say this a lot lately. The church must be the spiritual thermostat. We set the spiritual climate of the nation. If we don't like what we see going on in our world, then you know what? We need to hit our knees. We need to pray. We need to fast. We need to humble ourselves. We need to repent. We need to come together in the park and pray. Come on, we need to do. We need to go. We need to be. We got to learn. We got to learn to be part of the solution and not the problem. And, and, and let me say this, and, and I'll close. My goodness, there's so many more things I could say. The church has been good at pointing out what's wrong with the world. It's kind of like what we've done here today, right? And that's part of our job. It is. That, that's part of our job to call sin, sin. But how many understand it doesn't do us any good to come in here and to point out all these sins, to point out all the faults of our world, to curse, to stand here and to curse the darkness, but refuse to light a candle. If that's all we've done here today is just come and complain about how bad the world is, and how frustrated we are with everything that's going on in the world, guess what? We really haven't done anything. But if we'll let our light so shine before men, if we'll arise and shine, for our light has come. What that means is, and I understand, I, I get overwhelmed as well. The devil comes and whispers in my ear just like he does, you're, you're only one person. You can't make a difference. Nobody's paying attention to what you're saying or doing. How many know the devil is a liar? Because what happens if we all do that, then guess what? We sit home and we do nothing, and the devil gets his, key, his work accomplished. But if we will do our thing, look at your neighbor and say, just do your thing. If you will go to work, if you'll go to school, at home, wherever life takes you, and if you'll be a light, if you'll be part of the solution, if perhaps you'll be just a little bit bolder than you were before, come on, how many know we can all be a little bolder? Not arrogant, not egotistical, not holier than thou, but if we can be a little bolder in our faith, the righteous are bold as a lion in the Wicked fleas with no man pursue you. That's it. That's it. So if we can just do our thing and be faithful in that, if we can be the witness to our family, if we can be the light in our family, how many know our families need Jesus? You say, you say, but Steve, you don't know my family. They've, they've already turned me off. Well, I understand that to a certain degree, but I believe they're still watching us. I believe they're still watching us. And they're seeing how we respond to all of this stuff. So if we can be encouraged, if we can be a light, if we can be a voice, if we can be a city set on a hill, Mm. Stand with me. I've, I've got to quit.
you know, today as we restarted our, our breakfast and children's church and nursery, and what, this is the first time that we've had communion together in four months. I begin to think about the last four months. This morning as we were here and we were praying and just preparing some things, I begin to think about the last four months. And I said, God, what's the next four months going to be like? What's the next four months going to be like? How many can feel the urgency of the hour? How many are beginning to carry a burden for this world, for this nation, for the lost? Oh, God. Oh, God. Come on, church. Just like somebody prayed us into the kingdom, we got to pray somebody else into the kingdom. We need, we need a burden for the lost. We need to push back the plate. I'm going to ask you to come and just find a place of prayer. we got plenty of room up here. You can get up on the altar, the pews, the chairs, the floor. Just... Let's just come and seek the face of God here this morning with me. Would you please?